Good morning, everyone. My name is Clive. And my name is Free Rose. And we'd like you to welcome you to our online service. And hopefully uh, you have a good time. So if you know anybody that's currently not watching, make sure that you send the link and share it with them. So we've got a few announcements for you. So on Mondays, we've got our evening prayers at 6.30 on Zoom. On Wednesdays, we have our, our Bible study at 6.30 on Zoom as well. And on Fridays, we've got our games night at 6.30 on Zoom. So if you want to join us, uh, play different games, um, you're more than welcome to. And if you want to learn how to cook, we've got our cooking classes on Saturdays at 6.30. That's also on Zoom. And uh, today, we're going to be carrying on with our series, God Is. So we're going to continue from the last few weeks. Hopefully, you enjoy, have a good time, and make sure you take some notes. So sit back and relax, make yourself comfortable while uh, Patrick and Yolanda lead us in worship. Mm-hmm. 
in Exodus chapter 34, verse 5 to 8. And as you get the scriptures uh, ready this morning, I really want to say thank you uh, to everyone uh, that's been faithful uh, during this lockdown period in their giving. Uh, you know, you've supported your church probably through a very difficult season for yourself and even for the church itself. And so, and so you've been faithful. And I've been receiving uh, phone calls and having conversations with a lot of folks in our church. And even during this lockdown season, God has worked his miracles once again. There are people that are getting jobs, people that are getting promoted. Even whilst they're not going to work or working from home, uh, God has been faithful. And so I believe that God is simply honoring us because we have uh, been faithful in our giving. So I want to encourage you to continue to give. Uh, giving details are going to be on the screen uh, for you to give in the course of this service. Uh, uh, let's continue to be faithful and God sees our giving. So currently we're in a series uh, that we started about two weeks ago called God Is. Uh, God is. So two weeks ago, we looked at God is good, that everything that flows out of God is good. God wants you and I to experience his goodness. Then last week, we spoke about God is compassionate, that God sees what we're going through, feels what we're going through, and he longs to bring relief to our pain and our suffering. And our statement last week was pretty much this. God sees it, he feels it, and he desires and wants to fix it. And so uh, we serve a God that chooses to personally get involved in our suffering so he can bring complete relief uh, to our pain. And we spoke about Jesus and we said this about Jesus, that Jesus is the visible image of an invisible God. And something that makes Jesus so special was this, that he chose to suffer with us. He came alongside of us. He uh, faced the same things that we faced. He walked our road. Uh, Jesus was brokenhearted. He was betrayed. He was humiliated. He had family issues just like you and I. And he chose to come and suffer with us, to walk the road that we walked. Uh, not only did he suffer with us, but he suffered for us. Uh, he suffered for us. And here's the thing that we spoke about last week, that there is nothing you will ever go through in life that Jesus hasn't experienced. Uh, so Jesus understands us uh, because he's a savior that chose to suffer with us uh, and to suffer for us. God is a God full of compassion. And so today we want to explore and examine another is of God. And so this is something that God chose to reveal to Moses and to you and I about himself. Uh, and we want to look at this. Uh, we want to look at this is today. God is gracious. God is grace. Taken from uh, Exodus 33, uh, verse 18 to 20. Remember, we uh, took our text and we broke it down into three. We have the request that Moses makes. Then we have God's response, how God responds to Moses' request. And then we have the big reveal in chapter 34, what God does in order to show Moses what he is like. And so let's read our text. Exodus 33 verse 18 says, Then Moses said, Please show me your glory. That's the request. And here's the response. And God said, I will make my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord your God. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, Moses, for no man shall see, my, uh, shall see me and live. Here's Moses. He asks God, God, show me your glory. And God says, if you want to see me, uh, you're going to have to see my goodness uh, because everything about me is good. Everything that flows from me is good. Moses, I'm going to allow you to see my goodness. That's what God says to Moses. And then in chapter 34, we get the big reveal. God takes Moses onto the, uh, into the mountain and places him into the cleft of the rock. And, then, and God, God says to Moses, because you can't see my face and live, I'm going to put my hand and cover your face and cover your eyes. And as I'm passing by, I'll remove my hand and I'll reveal to you my glory and I will show you what I'm, and I will, I'll show you or announce what I'm like. And God begins to announce who he is or give a self-disclosure of who he is. So let's read uh, chapter 34, verse 5 to 8 together. Then the Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with Moses as he proclaimed the name of the Lord. 
Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting and avenging the iniquity, sin and guilt of the fathers upon the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. And at this, Moses bowed to the earth and immediately worshipped God. Here's God. And God reveals himself to Moses. And remember last week we spoke about how he begins to announce himself or self-disclose himself to Moses. God has to say his own name three times. And so he says, the Lord, the Lord God. And these are the names of God. And we spoke about the, uh, the name Lord uh, is the English uh, translation or a uh, translation or identification of God's name Jehovah, which means I am that I am. So God says, I am that I am three times. Then he uses the name God, which is Elohim, which is his creative name, he, uh, which is his creative name. So to paraphrase this text or, or this announcement, God is simply saying this, I am that I am the creator God, and I am gracious. I am that I am, the creator God, I am gracious. And so God is a God of grace. God is saying to Moses and he's saying to you and to me, before you can label me, before you can place any labels on me and try to define or redefine what I'm like, I want you to know that I am grace. I am gracious. Moses, the God that is passing by you right now, is a God who is gracious. Psalms 145 verse 13 put it this way. It said, Lord, uh, the Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all he does. Psalms 145 verse 17 puts it this way. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. See, God is gracious in all he does. In everything he does, in all his works, God is gracious. What this means is that when he's working in your life, God is working through his grace. He's gracious in all he does for you. He's gracious as he does things in your life. All his works are gracious. God is a God who is gracious. The word grace in the Greek is the word charis. It means to show favor. The main synonym, uh, synonym for the word grace is actually the word favor. So whenever in the Bible you read the word favor, you need to understand or sub, you can substitute that word with the word grace. Favor equals grace and grace equals favor. Here's an example. Genesis chapter 6 verse 8 talking about Noah. The Bible says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We have a guy in our church called Favor. And I bet he's going to enjoy this sermon and even this illustration. Because Favor's name simply means grace. And whenever we see favor, we ought to think about grace. And I hope favor, you're going to grow in grace. And so what's important about this word favor when it's used in the Bible, it was a word used for a superior showing favor to the inferior. It was used for kings when a king showed kindness or favor to a peasant. When the worthy showed favor and kindness to the unworthy. It was sort of like this. It was somebody up there doing something for somebody down here that somebody down here could not get done on their own apart from somebody up there making it happen. I repeat that it's somebody up there doing something for somebody down here uh, that the somebody down here could not have done for themselves uh, apart from the somebody up there doing something for them or making it happen for them. God is the somebody up there that chooses to stoop down and do something for the somebody or the nobody down here like you and me uh, and uh, to do something we could have never done for ourselves. Uh, that is what grace means. It is favor, it is to do something um, for somebody that the person could have never done for themselves. And notice what the Bible says about grace and God 
in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, it says, The Lord longs to be gracious. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. God longs to be gracious. God is driven by grace. Uh, God is a God who longs to do things uh, for you that you could not have done for yourself. God is a gracious God. Uh, God longs to intervene uh, in your sin issue to bring freedom. He longs to intervene in your addictions to make you clean, uh, in your failures to restore you, uh, in your mistakes to fix you, uh, in your weaknesses uh, to uh, strengthen you, uh, in your hurts to heal you, uh, in your poverty to turn it into prosperity. He longs to step down into your situation uh, and do for you what you could not have done for yourself. He is a God of grace. Another definition, or rather direct definition of this word grace, is this is the biblical or the theological definition of grace, and it uses two words put together. It is this, unmerited favor. Meaning that grace is not given to someone because they have merits or have worked or have done something to deserve it. But grace is unmerited. Favor was not shown to the deserving. It was given to the undeserving. You know, sometimes when we use the word favor, we say to our friends, do me a favor. Right? So we're talking to people who are our friends, uh, who can do something back for us, or we can do something in return for what they've done. But that's not the biblical meaning of the word favor. Favor is simply someone doing something for someone that couldn't have done it for themselves. Uh, and so another definition of this word favor is unmerited, uh, or grace rather, is unmerited favor. Favor was shown to the des- uh, favor was not shown to the deserving. It was given to the undeserving. Therefore, grace is this: grace is undeserved, uh, unmerited, and unearned. It's not based on what you do or have done or did. It is completely and utterly undeserved uh, and unearned. Someone once put it this way: grace wasn't something you could apply for. It was something you were invited into. I love that. In other words, you could not do an application for grace. You could not write down why you should receive grace. You could not list the requirements or the things you've attained in order to receive grace. You could not put down your merits for grace. In other words, there is nothing you could ever do. You couldn't put a profile. You couldn't hype yourself up in order to get grace. Grace was simply an invitation. You was invited into grace. Do you know why? Because grace is a gift. And grace is always free. It's the worthy God showing kindness and favor and goodness to the unworthy and undeserving. Grace is what God does for you that you could have never done for yourself. He does it not because you deserve it or because you earned it. He does it out of his goodness and love for you. That is what grace is. And grace is the, fund of, uh, is the foundational principle of your faith and my faith. If you miss grace, you miss, uh, if you miss grace or misunderstand grace, uh, you will miss all that you need in life. Uh, you will miss all you need uh, to live a life that God intended for you to live. Grace is the foundation of our faith. Jay Gresham put it this way. The very center and core of the whole Bible is the doctrine of the grace of God. That when you take the whole book, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the theme that overrides everything is this one word, grace. But the problem we have here is that if you miss grace, you will miss God. If you miss grace, you will miss God. Because the whole Bible The whole concept of Christianity is about grace. In fact, Paul put it this way. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 says, uh, uh, it says this, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. Paul's talking to the Hebrews, the the Jewish people, the guys that got given the law. And he's saying to them, listen, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. This is so important because now we understand that we can actually miss the grace of God. 
Because we can misunderstand the grace of God, miss the grace of God, and when we do miss it, and when we misunderstand it, guess what we get? We get religion. See, grace is what makes the difference, but when we miss grace from our theology, we get religion. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. He says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, that it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul says this, he says, your salvation, you are saved by grace. Grace is a gift from God. There is nothing you did in order to earn it. There is nothing you did in order to deserve salvation. It was a gift from God based on his grace because God is a God of grace. Notice what it says, not by works, lest any of you should boast. In other words, if we had to work for it, we'll have a reason to boast. But no one can boast because grace is free. See, humanly speaking, we don't understand grace. Because we live in a world that says you get what you deserve. In fact, when people hurt you, you want them to get what they deserve. When people disappoint you, you want them to get what they deserve. In fact, some of us, even in our minds, we plan ways to show them that they're getting what they deserve for what they've done. We don't fully understand and grasp grace. Because sometimes grace will seem unfair. Because grace will seem unfair because we are rule keepers. And so when we see someone else break the rules that we've been keeping, we begin to question whether grace is fair. You see, sometimes grace can seem unfair, but that's a message for another day. See, when we misunderstand grace, you become like a Pharisee. You become religious. You begin to live to earn God's approval and acceptance based on performance and keeping the law or keeping the rules. See, if the Pharisees missed God because they missed grace. The Pharisees missed God because they missed grace. Remember, we spoke about Jesus being the visible expression of God. That Jesus is the visible, uh, is the visible uh, image of an invisible God. And so Jesus Christ was actually God's grace on earth. That if you want to see grace, if you want to see the grace of God, uh, you just need to look at Jesus. Jesus put it this way, if you've seen the Father, you have seen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so if God is gracious, therefore look to Jesus in order to see what grace looks like. If you want to see what grace looks like, simply look at Jesus. And scriptures are filled with Jesus dispensing grace on the undeserving. In fact, John, the author of the book of John, a disciple of Jesus, uh, when he begins to introduce Christ in his book, John, he begins by letting us know who Jesus Christ is. And John chapter 1 verse 1 puts it this way, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's what John says in the beginning. He says, listen, there is this mysterious relationship in heaven. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You can't separate God and the word because the word was God. I love it. So then John gives us his concept as he begins to introduce Christ. Uh, and notice what he says in John uh, 1 verse 14. This word... The word that he speaks about in verse 1, the word that was in the beginning, the word that was with God, the word that was God, notice what he says in verse 14, the word became flesh. Another translation says the word became a human and it dwelt and, and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. Remember Moses asked to see God's glory. And John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. The glory as as the only son of the father. Notice what it says, full of grace and truth. That when John sees Jesus, uh, he describes Jesus as being full of grace. 
and truth. That Christ was full of grace. Now verse 15 begins to open this up even more. He says, we all have received from his fullness grace upon grace. That we saw him, we lived with him, we saw what he did, his death, his resurrection, and we all received the fullness of grace upon grace. In other words, Jesus stacked up grace upon grace. Everything's grace upon grace. Uh, that's verse 16. Then notice what he says in verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Moses gave us the law. Jesus gave us grace and truth. You see, to see grace, look at Jesus. Jesus was grace in real life. Jesus was grace in high definition. Everything about Jesus was spelled grace. Everything about Jesus cried out grace. Everything he did exhibited grace. Every word he spoke was full of grace. Every miracle full of grace. Every healing full of grace. Every rebuke full of grace. Everything exhibited grace uh, from his birth to his death. It all spells out grace. Uh, his resurrection to his return announces grace. Uh, Jesus is the grace of God made visible. Christ is the grace of God uh, manifested uh, in human form. Uh, to see grace, look at Jesus. He was full of grace, uh, grace upon grace. Uh, so here's the description we get about Jesus. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Uh, there was grace upon grace. Uh, the fullness of grace was found in him, uh, yet the religious people of his time missed him. Why did they miss grace? Because they were so focused on the law. See, the law produces religion. But grace produces relationships. When you are touched by grace, it births relationships. When Christ walked around the, uh, the earth and did what he did and dispensed grace, uh, people followed Jesus uh, because you cannot be touched by grace and not fall in love with the grace giver. You cannot be touched by grace and not fall in love with the grace giver. And to understand grace, it's difficult enough to define in words. But throughout the New Testament, we have these pictures or these incidences that happen that show us what grace was like or how Jesus dispensed grace. And in John chapter 8, we have this amazing but also sad story of a woman that's been uh, caught in adultery. And she's been caught in the very act. And it's early morning. Jesus is teaching in the temple. There are people gathered around. They're listening to Jesus speak. And we know the Bible tells us that when Christ spoke, he spoke and he was full of grace, even in his words. So people are gathered together. They're listening to Jesus in the temple. Jesus is teaching them, talking to them about the kingdom of God and about the love of God. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees of the time, break in. There is a commotion. They have a woman with them. Maybe this woman is probably half-dressed because the Bible tells us she was caught, or they tell us they caught her in the very act of adultery. She's no doubt broken, and she's flung right in front of Jesus. And as they fling her right in front of Jesus, she falls to the ground, and these religious leaders are holding stones in their hands, ready to stone this woman because she's broken the law, the law that Moses gave. And this is what they say in John chapter 4, John chapter 8, verse 4, rather. They say this to Jesus, teacher, they say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone them, what do you say? You see, right there we have an understanding of how the law works. You see, the law exposed this woman's guilt. The Lord showed us her shame. The Lord showed us she was guilty, inadequate. She, was, she had a weakness. She had an inability to live righteously. The law exposed her. And these men bring her to Jesus and say, this is what the law says. She is guilty and therefore she must face the full weight of the law. But Jesus looks at this woman. And no doubt these religious people saw her guilt. 
But Jesus, because he's compassionate, saw right through her guilt, saw the reasons why, understood the brokenness within her, and saw the fear, the dread, as she lay there, knowing that death was just around the corner. But Jesus didn't just see her guilt. He also saw the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. That here are these men, that they're bringing this woman to them, to him rather. And they too have their own guilt. They too have their own issue. They're driven by pride. This is what religiousness would do. It would, a pride would drive you, that you're better than everyone else, that everyone else, that we demand justice for what's happened. And that's what the Lord does. That's what the Lord does. And here they are. Here they are. They bring this woman before Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say anything. The Bible tells us Jesus writes on the ground. Verse 6 puts it this way. The reason why they brought the woman, they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. They didn't care about the woman. They cared about being right. They didn't care about the pain. They cared about being prominent and being right and exposing Jesus as not being the Messiah. That's all they cared about. And sometimes when we become religious, that's what we do. We forget about the person. And we concentrate on the rules. It carries on and says, But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. See, Jesus didn't answer them because they were right. The Lord demanded her death. She was guilty of first degree adultery. She deserved to be stoned. Remember, Jesus knows what the law says. He gave the law. So Jesus understood they were right. However, Jesus does something quite extraordinary and peculiar. Verse 6 to 11 says, But Jesus stooped down and rode on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear them. So they continued asking him. He stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone to her. Again he stooped down and rode on the ground. Being convicted by their conscience, those who heard it went out one by one, beginning with the eldest even to the last. Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Uh, verse 10, When Jesus had stood up and saw no one but the woman, he said to a woman, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see, the law condemned her to death. By grace, Jesus covered over her guilt. Grace was greater than her sin. Grace was greater than her shame. Grace was greater than her secret. Grace, uh, grace turned uh, the worst day of her life into the best day of her life. See, in that moment, they thought they were exposing her to a sinner, uh, but they were exposing her to the Christ. Uh, they were exposing her to grace. Uh, and when she saw grace, uh, she felt grace. Uh, she experienced grace. Uh, and a bad day turned to becoming the best day of her life. Listen, if you don't know the grace of God, if you don't know Jesus, today can be the best day of your life uh, when you get to experience uh, the grace of God. Uh, all you need to do is accept Jesus into your life. See, here's an amazing truth. Grace took over and displaced the law. At that moment, grace took over and displaced the law. You see, all the law could do was expose sin, but the law could not fix the mess. But grace fixes what the law exposes. Grace fixes what the law exposes. Grace is greater than our sin. You know, I was 
thinking about this. And I was asking the question. I was asking the question. I said, hang, hang on. Why is it that Jesus wrote with his finger on the ground and no one knows what he wrote? Some people speculate. They say, well, maybe he wrote the names of the Pharisees and he, ra- he writes their names and then he puts a, a dash and says uh, and lists all their sins. So when these Pharisees are asking for God, uh, for Jesus to say something, uh, they can't help but note that he's writing on the ground. And if he's writing on the ground, uh, what are they going to do? They're going to try and check what is he writing. And as they stoop down to look at what he's writing, they see their name and their sins. Uh, and that's why Jesus gets up and says, he, we, he who is without sin, uh, let him cast the first stone. Uh, and obviously they've read their sins are uh, being listed by Jesus uh, from the elders to the youngest because the older have more sins and the younger don't uh, have less. Uh, they left and went their way. They could not condemn her because they saw their own sin. But that's just what some people say. It might be true. It might not be true. But we don't know what Christ wrote. But then I discovered something. In Exodus chapter 32, I believe, when Moses is on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, the Bible tells us that God wrote the law with his own finger. Fast forward, Jesus comes along. A woman is exposed by the law. And Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God, writes a new law on the ground with his finger. And that law is spelled grace. You see, grace displaces the law. And Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 5, verse 15. But God's free gift is not like Adam's sin. Many people died because of the sin of that one man. But grace from God was much greater. Many people received God's gift of life by grace, uh, by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ. Paul says, uh, that, that the, but, uh, Paul says, but the grace from God was far greater. It was a greater grace. It was more powerful, more stronger, much greater Romans chapter 5, in fact, in the Passion Translation, it says this. I love what it says. It says, now there is no comparison between Adam's transgressions or sins and the gracious gift that we experience. For the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. It's true that many died because of one man's sin. But how much greater will God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow to many because of what one man, Jesus the Messiah, did for us? You see, grace is greater than our sins. It's greater than your sin. Grace is greater than your shame. It's greater than your failures. It's greater than your fears. It's greater than your hurts. greater than your weaknesses. And greater than your circumstances. There is nothing you will go through that God's grace cannot come and cover over. But grace allows you uh, to lean in and enjoy and endure life. Uh, when you know the grace of God, uh, you're able to lean into Jesus uh, when you're going through things. Uh, when you're having circumstances that you don't understand take place uh, in your life, uh, you're able to lean in. Grace allows us to lean in and enjoy and endure this salvation that's being given to us. Grace, uh, this is what grace is, but the mistake we make is within grace is a license to sin. Actually, grace isn't a license to sin, but grace is a great motivator not to sin. Notice what Jesus says to this woman after she experienced grace. Death was knocking on her door. She knew that this was going to be her last day. And then she gets up uh, and sees all her accusers gone. Uh, Jesus asks her, where are your, your, uh, your accusers? Uh, did no one condemn you? And Jesus turns around and says, neither do I. And notice what Jesus says. Uh, because you've experienced grace, uh, now go and sin no more. Saved people value grace. And when you value grace, uh, the gift of grace, it gives you a motivation uh, in what you do. It gives you a motivation to live clean, a motivation to say no to sin, uh, a motivation to serve, a motivation to love others, a motivation uh, to be moved with compassion. Because you understand what you've experienced. Uh, You deserved death. You deserved the punishment. uh, But God gave you what you did not deserve. uh, And grace is a great motivator not to sin. Sin, but not a license to sin. 
See, that's what grace is. And with his finger, Jesus wrote a new law. It wasn't an outward law. It became an inward law, a law of the heart. So God is gracious. Jesus is full of grace. And you are invited to experience this life-changing grace. Now, many of us were put off church because of religion. Because of the rules and the regulations, the standards. I I know, uh, we all went through this where we were always given rules and regulations, standards. God doesn't like this, God doesn't like that, God doesn't like that. And uh, and a lot of us uh, uh, shied away from church. In fact, the moment you feel, you think church, you think, okay, what do I have to give up? What do I have to give up? And I know, we felt that way. And I do know that there's some things that God will not tolerate. And actually, when you understand grace, you can embrace the rules and the standards even better. Because you understand that the rules and the regulations are given through the eyes of grace. Not the eyes of wanting to control and manipulate and uh, uh, bring obedience through fear. But actually, some of the laws and the standards of God were given out of his grace to try and help you not suffer in life and feel the pain or consequences of sin. But that's a sermon for another day. But we have a guy in the Bible as I close this morning. His name was Saul. Saul persecuted the church. And Saul had an encounter with Jesus and he was invited into grace. Uh, Saul's experience with Christ that totally transformed him. It transformed everything about this guy Saul that he had to change his name into Paul. Saul persecuted the church. Saul was a Hebrew. He was a Jew. He lived by the law and followed the law to the T. He dotted every I and put the cross on the T. He was a man fully driven by living up to the standards of God's law, the law of Moses. So what did Paul do? Paul persecuted the church. Saul persecuted the church. He killed Christians. He made sure he got decrees in order to find those that believed in Christ and put them into prison, lock them up and witness their stoning. Paul was greatly motivated by the law. But everything changed when he met grace. Everything changed when he met Jesus. And grace became his great motivator. That Paul refers to himself as the bond servant of Christ. Grace got him into serving God. And notice what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 as he describes himself. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength to do his work. In other words, he doesn't even say I am doing the work. He says, Christ gave me the strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy. And appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me, because I did it in ignorance and non-belief. Oh, how great, oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that comes from Christ. This is a trustworthy, trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ could use me as a prime example of his great patience even with the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul experienced the grace of Christ and it transformed him. Paul is an example that of you can never be far too far gone to experience God's grace. Your past doesn't determine his grace. Your failures don't determine his grace. Your mistakes don't determine his grace. Your fears don't determine his grace. God wants you to experience his grace because it's something he does to the undeserving. Knowing his background, his hostility towards Jesus, hostile towards the church, This man gets a taste of grace and grace totally transforms him. He faces hardship. He handles persecution. He's, uh, you know, so many things go through Paul. He's in prison most of his uh, later life. uh, He was tested. uh, But because he had tested the grace of God, he was able to endure all that he went through. Can I say that when you learn to lean into the grace of God, it will help you navigate 
some of the painful circumstances that you will go through in life. In fact, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27, Paul begins to tell us what he's gone through. Listen to what he says. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been up in prison often, been whipped many a times without number, and I faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was bitten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day at drifted sea. I traveled on many long journeys. I faced danger from the rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long in Jews with many sleepless nights. I, I've been hungry, thirsty. I have, uh, I have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And Paul goes on and on and on and on. And then he ends by saying this, but in my weakness, I am made strong because of the grace of God. Here's a man that is able to endure, to ride the storms of life because he had experienced grace. And you too can experience the grace of God. And Paul, this guy Paul, uh, Saul was so bad, he changed his name to Paul, ends up writing two-thirds of the New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament and 13 or 14 of them were written by this guy Paul. He wrote more books in the New Testament than Peter, than James, than maybe all the disciples put together. What changed? He met grace. Why did he write more books? Because of grace. In fact, every book that Paul writes, it ends, it starts by talking about grace, and it ends talking about grace. Romans chapter 1, the book of Romans starts off by saying this, May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And it ends by saying these words, uh, May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, both books start by saying, May the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, give you grace and peace. And both books end by saying, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He starts his books with grace. He ends his books with grace. Uh, Ephesians uh, starts off, may our God, the Father, the Lord of, our, of Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Philippians starts, may the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Uh, Titus, the same. Timothy, the same. Uh, Philemon, the same. Uh, Thessalonians, the same. Uh, all the books he writes, um, he starts off by talking about grace and peace. And why does he do that? Because Paul wanted you to understand and to know this. Peace comes from understanding and experiencing God's grace. When you try and earn God's approval, try and earn his acceptance by doing, when you work, uh, when your work, when you work like your works will make you deserve it, uh, when you try and hit the standards and fail, you burden yourself with undue pressure. You carry a load you weren't intended to carry. And when you burden yourself with these things, guess what happens to peace? Peace goes flying away. And Paul says, when you understand grace, peace will follow. Because you don't have to put pressure on yourself to live up to a standard that none of us can live up to. See, God's grace brings peace because you understand that there is nothing you could ever do to deserve it, to earn it, merit it. Grace is always free. When you understand grace, it liberates you and frees you to be who God called you to be. God saved you by grace. God sustains you by grace and God strengthens you by grace. You know, I close by making this statement. Grace means God stoops down to do for you what you could never do for yourself. And God wants you to experience grace. Here's an acronym. Grace. Grace. 
The G stands for God's gift to me. Grace is a gift to you. The R, grace must be received by faith. Grace is a gift that must be received. A, it's available to everyone. Grace is a gift that must be received and is available for you. C, and it comes through Christ. E, and it extends throughout eternity. So grace is a gift from God. You must receive it. It's available. It only comes through Christ and it extends throughout eternity. The results of grace will last forever. Do you know the grace of God? Are you living in the grace of God? Listen, if you don't know the grace of God, you're probably carrying loads that you should never have been carrying. You're probably carrying weights that you should have been carrying. But today you have a chance to give it all up and give it to Jesus and ask him to gift you with his grace. Maybe you're not a Christian. You're not saved and you shied away from God because you thought, uh, you thought it was all about rules and keeping rules. No, there's no rule we could ever keep. We break those rules, those Ten Commandments all the time. The Ten Commandments simply expose how sinful we are. But it's grace that comes along and fixes it. The cross of Jesus Christ was grace at work. The resurrection was grace at work. Why? Because he died for you to set you free, to give you the ability to be able to live for God and to make heaven your home. It's never too late to accept him into your life. I hope you have a fantastic week this week. But before we go, I just want you to pray. I want you to spend some time in prayer, and we're going to pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for your grace. If it wasn't for grace, where would we be? We thank you that your grace brings peace to our life. We thank you that you are a gracious God. You give us what we don't deserve. That there's nothing we could ever do to earn your approval or your acceptance. But it's in your nature to be gracious. You stooped down in the form of Christ, died on the cross for us, and now heaven awaits us, not because we deserve it, but because you're gracious. And we thank you for that. Listen, spend some time this morning praying and speaking to God. Whilst Patrick and Yolanda come, and, uh, and worship with us this morning and sing a, uh, a song for us this morning. Listen, have an amazing week. And don't forget, God is grace. Yeah.